All right, welcome. Thanks for joining. Today, we're going to be talking about the ethics of insurance fraud investigations, the boundaries, best practices, and compliance. My name is Adam Visnick. I appreciate you jumping on. Let's chat. Let's talk some more. Let's chew on this. Let's start with a question that hopefully you all have an answer to. And that question is, did you know that insurance fraud is equal to over 300 billion dollars per year. That is a ton of money. And that includes health insurance fraud, Medicaid, Medicare, life insurance, property liability, workers comp, and more to get to that number. Study was done in 2022. How much does that actually equal? What does it look like? Well, 15,000 lunches with Warren Buffett costs a couple million bucks to eat lunch with Warren Buffett. You can go there and have a nice DQ blizzard or a nice catered dinner with him. It's worth uh, over 5,000 trips to the International Space Station and back. And lastly, it's equal to the gross domestic product of Chile. No, not Skyline Chile. Sorry for all the Gold Star people out there. But it's the gross domestic product of the country of Chile. That is a ton of money. So what? What does that mean to you? How much are we actually paying personally for every living American on the planet? Well, to be exact, whoops, to be exact, that should say $932 per year. I failed there technologically. $932 per year for every living American or $70,000 over the course of your lifetime. That's a decent chunk of change. That's a few grocery bills. That's college tuition for a semester. But what can we do about it? We'll summarize this very quickly. What can the average person do about it? Not just an insurance adjuster or somebody who's already in the space. What can the average person do? Well, there's three pieces. Three pieces of tactics you can take, strategy you can take to prevent it. You can educate yourself about the different types of insurance fraud from staged accidents to exaggerated claims to false information and forged documents. You can stay informed about the news, about the most common scams that you might make you less vulnerable. You could take workshops or seminars, much like we're doing today. You can do some prevention techniques. You can document all your transactions. You can make communications. You can properly record that way you don't You can identify some discrepancies in the insurance claim. You can verify the credentials of the people involved, making sure they're licensed and reputable. You can secure your personal information. Fraudsters often rely on obtaining personal data to commit fraud. And thirdly, you can report suspicious activity. Reporting the activities or anomalies in the claims process related to insurance. You can do it anonymously. You can do it with an insurance company. You can collaborate with an insurance company and provide all necessary information to assist in the investigations. Cool. That's great. But what about insurance companies? What about uh, large employers? They can do all these things. What happens if stuff goes awry and you take a next step? Well, you can hire a private investigator. You can hire a private investigator, and I chose this picture specifically to illustrate what not to hire because the guy in a trench coat and fedora isn't what we look like it's a great halloween costume got halloween coming up i've dressed up as magnum pi before but private investigations companies can be mom and pop organizations they can be regional companies and they also can be nationwide they can also be global too rarely are they guys like this think suit and tie rather than fedora But we're constantly trying to battle the stigma of modern TV and film, as well as past TV and film, magazines, books, you name it. But before we dive into that, I wanted to give you a little slide, a couple slides on me. Thanks for that great introduction. My name is Adam Visnick. I'm the president and founder of Gravitas Investigations. But first and foremost, I'm dad and I'm husband. Dad and husband, I have a beautiful wife and three kids, six, five, and two. Love them to death. 
but there's a very good reason why I have more gray hair than I'd like, and there might be bags under my eyes. I'm also a little bit more caffeinated this morning than I'd like to be, so apologies for any jitters that I might display. I'm also a private investigator, have been for almost 20 years. Literally, my first job out of college was as a private investigator. My company, Gravitas Investigations, we're private investigators. We are former law enforcement, ex-military, and we solve the problems of businesses, law firms, and insurance companies of all sizes using investigative solutions. I love what I do. Like I said, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've loved every minute of it, not saying it's easy, but it's something I love to do. I feel like I was born to do this. Let's talk a little bit more about that down the way. But lastly, I'm coach. This is my little team from last season, little baseball team. I got two of my boys there and my little cheerleader in the middle. Absolutely love coaching ball. So back to private investigators, though. What can a private investigator do about it? So we know insurance companies often turn to private investigators if they need to do certain things. But what specifically and in general can a private investigator do? Let's knock that out real quick. Firstly, we detect and prevent fraudulent activities. Okay, That's a general high-level thinking. We detect and prevent fraudulent activities. What are the specifics though? That was high-level. What about the specifics, boots on the ground type things the levels, low level stuff do you actually see? Well, first that probably comes to mind is surveillance. Okay. A private investigator operative goes in the field, usually in their stakeout vehicle, like a minivan or SUV, tinted out windows, dark in color, and goes in documents using handheld digital high definition cameras to videotape everything that happens with your claimant or videotapes or takes pictures of a scene and many more pieces. There's also unmanned surveillance. If you're not familiar with that, you can stick a camera in just about any object nowadays, and we do, and put that object on public property or put it in covert cameras, but an unmanned camera might look like a traffic counter, it might look like a log, it might look like a utility post, these things that you see that houses the wiring for your cable and whatnot. Plenty of applications there. We also do interview, interviews and investigations or interrogations. So many of our private investigators are former detectives. It's very easy for them to make the transition to go over in the field and start interviewing people, documenting things, putting the pieces together. Your field claims adjuster might do that as well, but these guys come in as a third party and interview the powers that be. Your subjects personally, your neighbors, your relatives, the witnesses, employers, employees, etc. Nowadays, we also do social media canvases. Everybody and their grandmother has a Facebook account. So naturally, we're going to use our investigative techniques to document everything that people post about publicly on their Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok dances, YouTube, you name it. I would love to share many, many stories about people posting about their injuries they sustained while on the job for workers' comp or after the fact or they got in an auto accident these sorts of things. And then the three more, the background investigations. This is like old school investigations. We're simply digging the public records, uh, civil court records, police reports, previous addresses, all the open source data we can and compiling it into a background investigation to give you pre-existing injury, to, you know, red flags for fraud, all those kind of things that'll help with an investigation. Hospital canvases, that's where we legally and not violating HIPAA laws make efforts to reach out and contact hospitals for pre-existing injuries when documenting when they treated, uh, was it inpatient, outpatient, ER, what, what location, who were they treated by, and more, if we can get it. And then lastly, it also pays to have a digital forensics expert, one who can dig into smartphones, laptops, and these sorts of things, not hacking, We'll talk about that, but digital forensics, someone can dive into the computer, black boxes, and these sorts of things to help prevent and establish fraud potentially. Okay? Any questions about that? If you got a question about those things specifically, leave me a comment. But with all those pieces said, private investigations is not without controversies and challenges. Like 
is it ethical or is it legal? We mentioned a lot of things. And they, from the outside looking in, might look like those are illegal. But we'll talk about exactly what's legal and illegal, what's unethical here. But why, specifically, are ethical guidelines important? Why is it important? It seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? If you're ethical, it means repeat business. It means you don't go to jail. It means your industry is not frowned upon. Let's talk a few things uh, about a few points about that specifically. Why are ethical guidelines important? It seems obvious, but firstly, the protection of individual rights. The protection of individual rights ensures that investigators respect the rights and privacy of individuals. Without it, there's a risk of invasion of privacy, harassment, or even unlawful detention. We got to make sure that our investigations don't infringe on a person's right. Secondly, maintaining public trust. Confidence in the process is essential for public trust to both ensure the industry and the legal system. You got to have that trust. Without it, it can erode the trust and create a perception of bias or unfairness. Bias or unfairness. And then legal compliance. Adhering to ethical guidelines often coincides with following the law. Unethical behavior during an investigation may lead to legal challenges, making evidence inadmissible in court, and it can even result in criminal charges against the investigator and potentially law firms or insurance companies involved. Professionalism and reputation. Ethical standards help uphold the professional and integrity of the investigative field. Following the guidelines promotes a positive reputation, both for the individual investigators and the industry as a whole. Conflicts of interest. Ethical guidelines often address potential conflicts of interest, ensuring that investigators remain impartial and objective. It's crucial for the validity of the investigation and the fairness of the outcome. A couple more. Accurate and truthful reporting. We demand honesty and transparency when we report our findings. It ensures that the decisions are made based on accurate information and that there's accountability in the investigative process. We uh, imagine that a judge or jury or a lawyer is scrutinizing our legal documents, our reports. And if we have that standard internally, we'll be, we'll be good to go if we do get deposed or have to testify on behalf of what we witnessed or videotaped or reported. So everything has to go through that lens. Ethical guidelines help establish that. And then lastly, ethical investigations ensure that all parties are treated fairly and that conclusions are reached based on facts and evidence rather than assumptions, bias, or prejudice. Okay? Questions about that? Just leave a comment below. Let's move on. Another question for you, though. Did you know? that private investigators are regulated. If you've never hired a private investigator, never met one, never needed one, did you know that private investigators are required to be licensed? Licensing requirements in 45 out of the 50 states are needed to obtain a license to operate. Licensing involve, often involves several things. Background check, number one. Fingerprints, usually showing your experience, a few thousand hours on an existing license holder, or previous law enforcement experience, or military experience, education, usually an associate's degree or, ba or a bachelor's degree, reference check, and passing a qualifying examination. Those are a handful of things, and they change by from state to state, but we definitely need proof of liability insurance. Shocker, we're talking about insurance. We also need insurance for many, many reasons. Also, we have codes of conduct. I was just reading the Kentucky licensing requirements the other day. There's a code of conduct in there. It outlines the acceptable behavior and practices of private investigators. It includes guidelines on privacy, confidentiality, conflicts of interest, and interactions with clients, witnesses, and other parties. The third on the regulatory framework, oversight and regulatory bodies. There's an, there's an association or governing body tasked with overseeing the private investigators. We may, they may set the standards for how we operate. 
They may offer certifications. They may conduct investigations into misconduct and impose penalties for violations. Here's an example. There was an, a company recently in Indiana, I won't say the name, used some magical search engine optimization. So when a potential client types in private investigator near me down in Florida or Texas or California or Hawaii, their company is the first one that come up that came up. Now they weren't licensed in all of those states, but they had the geographic search engine optimization so that that, that happened. They were the first ones that come up. So they're stealing business from other companies. They were misrepresenting themselves that they were licensed in those specific states. So as a result, the regulatory body came along and fined them a few thousand bucks a couple different times. They did their job. Then privacy laws. The regulatory framework states that we must operate within, within the bounds of the privacy laws, which can vary greatly by jurisdiction. So it pays to know a private investigative company or, or, or a private investigator themselves that knows those specific laws. Rules about surveillance, data collection, and the use of personal information. And again, record keeping and, and reporting. The regulatory frameworks may require private investigators to maintain detailed records of their investigations, including the methods used, information gathered, and conclusions reached. In some cases, they must be submitted to a regulatory authority. Again, we passed every report through that lens as if it's going to be scrutinized in front of a grand jury. You know, we can't put in there some illegal method or some vague method that we use in the report for fear that it's going to get sent to an administrative hearing and a lawyer or a judge will see it, throw it out. And that obviously is not something we want to have happen. We want all of our reports to step, uh, t uh, test the, be able to stand the test. A couple more. Continuing education. Additionally, the frameworks state that we have to be up to date with the latest news, technologies, and techniques. And some jurisdictions man mandate continuing education or professional development as part of that. In Kentucky, for example, every two years, I think it's 16 hours of continuing education. Ohio doesn't have one, but Kentucky does. Indiana does not. There's a handful, a couple handfuls of other states that do require that. And it's as simple as online course, going to a couple day conference, going to things like this, for example, could potentially qualify. There's also stipulations on how we can collaborate with law enforcement. There might be guidelines for sharing info, conducting joint investigations, and respecting their jurisdictions. We can't go arrest someone. Uh, we can't detain someone. We're not cops. So we have to respect the boundaries that the law enforcement has. And then lastly, we have restrictions on how we can advertise our services and represent ourselves to the public. Going back to that company in Indiana that illegally used and violated laws regarding advertising, we can't state that we're licensed in a company in a, in a state that we're not. And we also can't misrepresent what we can do for the public. It includes rules about the use of titles, badges, uniforms, or claims about our capabilities and expertise. One thing that sticks out in some of the Kentucky licensing, for example, is that we can't go around flashing a badge. Even if we're current law enforcement, we can't use that badge for any investigative work that's private. Why do you think that is, though? If you're watching this, why do you think that is? I'll give you a hint. It's because if we show a badge to somebody, they're going to immediately assume, whether they look at it or not, that we're law enforcement and that we have more power than we actually do. We as private investigators have almost no power. We have, we have the licensing to in, in laws to do certain pieces, but we can't arrest you. We can't, in some cases, carry a firearm without, without a license there. And we can't do a lot of things. And we'll talk about specifically what we can do, but we can't hold a badge in Kentucky for sure. It might change by state to state. Okay, questions about that? That was some of the nitty gritty, but let's get into actual stories. Let's talk about some private investigators gone wild. Let's talk about specific laws pertaining to what we do, both federal and state laws. Okay, wiretapping. Wiretapping is a big one. Here's a guy by the name of Anthony Pelicano. Okay, who was he? Well, Anthony Pelicano was a California private investigator. He was the self-described Hollywood fixer. Or his TV show, 
of which there's two episodes on Hulu. I highly recommend you check it out. It's called The Sin Eater. The Sin Eater. He thought of himself as this old world Italian mafia style boss who had this ingrained code of secrecy. He would take in all these big high profile clients, these celebrities, these executives and producers at big film companies, these powerful attorneys, and eat their sins. He would do a lot of legal things, and we'll talk about it specifically what he did. But in the 90s, it's most likely that he was involved somehow in any major scandal that happened. He claimed involvement in the Monica Lewinsky scandal. He claimed involvement in O.J. Simpson trial. In the early 90s, he played a key role in the Michael Jackson child molestation case, working for Michael's camp to discredit accusations of sexual assault leveled against Michael. So aside from possessing illegally C4 explosives, two hand grenades, loaded pistols, and about $200,000 in cash in his office safe, which was raided and found by the FBI in 2002, he also had hundreds of hours on encrypted, illegally wiretapped conversations. Illegally wiretapped conversations. He was eventually accused of directing conspiracy aimed at blackmailing and intimidating dozens of celebrities and business, business executives, including Sylvester Stallone, Chris Rock, Gary Shanley. He was eventually sentenced to 15 years in jail after being found guilty of 78 felony charges. What is wiretapping specifically? In Ohio, to keep it close to home, Ohio is a one-party consent law, making it a crime to intercept or record any wire, oral, or electronic communication, unless one part of the conversation consents. If I'm in Ohio, you're in Ohio, I call you, I don't have to tell you, I can just start recording. That's the way I read it. That's what we've done for many of our cases. No problem. However, where it gets a little gray, if you're in certain states, and we'll show you a geographic map about this, if you're in other states, that's different. It's a little bit different. There's a thing called two-party states or all-party states. But wiretap phone means you can't record a conversation if you're not a party to it or you don't get permission from one party to the conversation. Sorry for the lengthy uh, block of text here, but it's almost always illegal to record if you don't have consent, if you could not naturally overhear. And so that means you can't place a bug a recording device on someone, in their phone, in a home, in an office, in a restaurant between two people who haven't consented. Specifically, I remember a case where a private investigator who was young, probably new to the game, wanted to prove himself, entered a restaurant, sat right next to or catty corner from a journalist and a senator. He wanted to overhear what's happening. He sat down a pen camera, which had audio technology, set it right there like this. And the senator and journalist apparently aren't dumb. They saw that happening. They saw it recognize the guy in their rear view mirror. And they called him out, called the cops on him. He got in big trouble for attempting to record in a diner the audio conversation from two people. Big time no-no. Here's the one-party versus two-party states. On the fringes of America, except for Illinois, it's two-party. Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana, you can see are one-party. Questions about that? Leave a comment below. What questions do you have? about one party, two party. I should stipulate that I'm not a lawyer myself. These are just the ways it's been interpreted from our end and using consensus industry standards here. Let's do a quick case study. Let's say we have a guy by the name of John Smith. He claims a loss after he gets a house fire. He demands a hefty payout from his insurance company, but Jane Doe and the insurance adjuster suspect fraud. They're smart, they see a bunch of red flags related to it. What should Jane not do when it comes to wiretapping? Well, Jane Doe, the private investigator, should avoid the temptation to wiretap Smith's phone or install a bug or hidden device in his house or his workplace. Anything that he does related to that is against the law and infringes on Smith's privacy rights. Any evidence collected would be inadmissible in court and could lead to legal consequences for Jane and the insurance company. What could Jane do? What few things could he do? Leave a comment on that below. 
here's what I would do, or here's what could be done. You can check public records and open sources. Inconsistencies in his claim or evidence of previously fraudulent activities might pop up if you check court records. If you're in the insurance space, an ISO search might look and see the historical insurance claims he might have had. And if he has a half dozen of them, well, that might be a red flag and might require further investigation. We could do surveillance to determine if this guy looks like the kind of person who just had a huge incident happen at his house or if he's an arsonist. An interview with the, the neighbors, the co-workers and others could help gather information about Mr. Smith. And obviously a fire examiner or forensic examiner might help, fraud examiner for that. To examine the scene, examine the fire, determine if there was any incidents of arson. Next, we'll dive into pretexting. Does anybody, has you heard that term? Do you know what a pretext is? When I first started, I had no idea what this was. But here's what it is in general. Just using a guise or a ruse to trick or gain information about somebody that they would not otherwise gain, give you. Many times it's personal information or account access. A lot of times it's used in social engineering if you're trying to hack or penetration test. Here's an example of that. In 2006, and this was a big deal back in the day, back in that day, Hewlett Packard hired private investigators to access the private phone records of board members and nine, nine journalists. What happened was HP had a leak. Someone had leaked their long-term strategy, among other things, and it became an article in CNET. The nine journalists involved were investigated by the private investigators and the board members, because that's where they suspected it would come from. The problem is the private investigator used illegal pretexting. They called the phone companies and it pretended to be the board members. They pretended to be the nine journalists. It's as simple as back in the day, it might be, hey, I am John Doe, board member of HP. Here's my date of birth. Here's my social security number. Can you email me all my phone calls for the past year? And he did that with the journalists too. That's what I was led to believe. But that's illegal. And here's what happened to him. The private investigator was convicted and sentenced to how many years of prison? And as a result, President Bush signed the Telephone Records and Privacy Act of 2006. Additionally, you probably heard of the Me Too movement. And maybe you've heard of Harvey Weinstein. Have you heard of him? Let me know if you've heard of that guy. Because... Harvey Weinstein was a famous Hollywood producer, incredibly powerful on some of the biggest name movies you'll ever have seen. But he used private investigators from a company known as Black Cube. I don't even think these guys were licensed. They call them, excuse me, they call themselves an intelligence agency rather than a private investigations company to skirt the law, from what I've read. Hired them to dig up information on the people that were accusing Harvey Weinstein of sexually assaulting him, or them, excuse me. This guy was, straightforward speaking, he was a rapist and he assaulted women on many occasions using his power to do so. He was arrested in New York in 2018 and then found guilty of two of five felonies in February of 2020, sentenced to 23 years in prison. But while that case was ongoing, the operative pretended to be women's rights advocates. One reached out to the actress Rose McGowan from the show Charmed, attempting to get information from her. That same one pretended to be one of Weinstein's victims themselves to speak with a journalist and get the names of the women involved. Some shady tactics. You can't misrepresent yourself as someone you are not with some stipulations. Let's talk about specifically what that means. So when it comes to pretexting, you cannot misrepresent yourself as your subject or claimant to attempt to obtain phone records. And you also can't attempt to be some high-powered person that works there to get the phone records. That's a no-no, unethical, illegal. Get caught, you're in big trouble. Similarly, for bank accounts, for financial records, for 529, 401k, stock, Roth, all those pieces, you can't pretend to be someone to get someone's bank account records. We get that phone call all the time. People want that um, as part of the investigation. We cannot do it. Now, it can come up during discovery if you're, if you're in like a child custody dispute, a divorce dis settlement, that can be requested, but that is not something we specifically do as private investigators anyway. And then you can't pretend to be a government official. You just can't. You can't be, pretend to be a law enforcement officer, journalist, lawyer, insurance claims adjuster if you're not one.
we as private investigators can't pretend to be any of those. And then we can't also call for your health information. With a caveat, we when we do these hospital canvases, we don't illegally pretext. We simply say we're doing a hospital canvas. And many times it, it works. So we do those quite a bit, but we can't do that if we are violating HIPAA laws as well as pretexting. That's a no-no. Questions about that? Leave a comment. On to the financial side, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act is our third one, the third law. It simply states what we can't hack into or impersonate the subject to obtain private information from a bank. Not going to do it. Here's a case study. Let's say Laura Johnson files an insurance claim after a costly medical procedure. The insurance company smartly is suspicious of the claim's validity and hires a private investigator named Mark Wilson to ascertain if Laura is committing fraud. Now, the wrong approach when it comes to hacking into the bank account is con he's considering hacking into the bank account because he's like Mr. Robot or using pretexting to access her financial records. He's aiming to find out if there's any large transactions or deposit that align with the time of her claim, which might indicate fraud. Okay, cool. That's illegal. If he proceeds, he would be violating the GLBA, which prohibits the use of fraudulent act activities to access someone's financial records, which is precisely what he'd be doing. If caught, that violation can yield civil penalties of up to 150 grand per violation. So I would highly recommend not doing that, Mark. Okay, fourthly, violation of privacy rights. Violating a person's solitude or seclusion in a bad faith way that would offend the reasonable person. Here's a few no-nos on that. Again, we can't hack computers. Private. You have to have a reasonable expectation of privacy. We can't place cameras in hidden locations, especially if they're private. They can be on public property or with consent or with permission, but not on private property, not hidden that way. We can't use long range cameras to take pictures through someone's window. That is considered an invasion of privacy. We can't use a drone to go right over someone's backyard if that backyard has a privacy fence. It might be different if it's, if there's no privacy fence. We have used drones in the past, but if they've got that privacy fence, that to us means a, they have a, a reasonable expectation of privacy. And then we can't intercept your mail or email. We can't reach into your mailbox, pull out your latest bank account information. We can't hack your email. We can't, however, trash pull. We can do a trash pull because if you put your um, garbage can on public property, set it out over the night, we might pull the trash once it's out there. That's not illegal. Here's a question for you. If we friend request one of our subjects or claimants on Facebook with a sock puppet account or a burner account, not our actual personal account, if we do that and then document everything that we see and then unfriend and request them, is that considered unethical? Whoops. My answer, yes. I believe it is Ill unethical. So no, we cannot friend request someone, accept the request, and then document everything that they have private. So we'll do everything that's public, but not, not private. There should be the answer no there. A specific case that happened that has actually ongoing now is the AmFam insurance case, American Family Insurance. The context is this. In 2012, a guy by the name of Mr. Al Masood drove a Jeep, crossed the center line, hit the claimant, Miss Mescatow in Georgia mangled her hand and arm. She filed suit against AmFam. Originally settled for $30 million, I want to say, and then 2016. That got rescinded, and then she filed suit again. But here's where it becomes problematic. Private investigators who were hired on behalf of AmFam and the law, and first, and law firm involved, I won't name the actual law firm or the investigation company, but AmFam hired them, and the problem was the private investigators unlawfully entered Mescatel's property. They conducted surveillance on her, but where they infringed on her rights is they entered her property, criminally trespassing, 
placed recording devices on her trees and GPS trackers on her vehicles and then continue to go back out there. Here's exactly what they did. They criminally trespassed by going onto her property, her residence, placed a GPS tracker on her vehicles. Now that act specifically is not illegal, but when you did it on her property, you beca it became illegal. She had several she had several vehicles, so they put two GPS trackers on one and trackers on others. And then they placed a trail cam on her property, on a tree on her property. It was a very rural area. So the only way they could get documentation of her doing anything is if they put these trail cameras on here. Here's what that trail cam looks like. We use this type of camera frequently, but we're, I guess, smart enough not to put it on people's private property. That's a big no-no. Um, you can put it on telephone poles with consent. You can put it on trees that are on easements that aren't considered private to help you out. But they put it on a tree on her property. This one's called the Spy Point Link Dark Camera. And documented everything that was happening. Usually you use this for hunting deer or game. But the problem was they went on her property and they kept going out there to replace the SD, cam the SD cards and batteries. All it was was a simple, hey, this is where a property line ends. This is where it begins. So they made big mistakes by not doing that in their preliminary investigation. Or maybe they knew about it, just continued to do it anyway. Questions about that? And the result was, in 2019, the subject filed suit selects, uh, successfully against AmFam, the law firm, and the PIs. Settled the case for $11 million, but it continues. She's additionally seeking $13.1 billion, billion with a B, in punitive damages. Can you imagine that? Okay, on to the GPS tracking itself. Let's talk about that. It's a hot topic because mobile tracking devices are now widely available to anyone online in stores. You probably, you might have an AirTag on you right now. Because parents use them to keep tabs on their kids and teenagers. Life360 is that GPS tracking app. It's the equivalent of basically a, an ankle monitor for prisoners. <laughs> Uh, you're basically just putting it on your kid's phone to track them. You might be also tracking uh, elderly uh, individuals with dementia and more and to locate your lost items like your keys, suitcase, and more. And because it's so prevalent, the laws are constantly changing. 26 states and the District of Columbia have addressed privacy concerns. 11 of those states have prohibitions on using tracking as part of stalking laws. Nine of those prohibit installing GPS on a motor vehicle without consent. And six of those have laws that are used to determine the location or movement of a person without consent. Questions about that? Leave a comment. Secondly, in Ohio, we just passed Senate Bill 100, which makes GPS tracking legal if we have the consent of the owner of the property. And then we can also be used in workers' comp investigations. Okay. So important. An example in real life recently that hit our industry is a guy by the name of David McNeely was hired to track a Reno, Nevada mayor named Hillary Shivey, and she found the GPS tracker. She got her oil changed one day, said there was a leak in it, and a guy went up under her car to repair and said, hey, there's a GPS tracker on your car. You might want to do something about this. Well, she found out it was registered to David McNeely and then this unknown third party that hired him. She tried to file suit against him for anti-doxing laws, for basically knowing her whereabouts, and for invasion of privacy. Also criminal trespassing, potentially. But Sparks Police, which was the entity involved, contacted the FBI, Secret Service, and other law enforcement agencies. They basically said that what he was doing was 100% legal, that no crime had occurred, and that there was no criminal element to McNeely's operations. So in that specific instance, nothing went wrong. Nothing happened. So it's important to know what state you're in, what are the laws surrounding GPS tracking, and pay attention to them. We get emails on what gets passed in, in the court and Senate and House in Ohio. And then knowing about what those laws look like in Kentucky and Indiana where we're licensed is important too. Moving on. An older case, this person here you see is Rebecca Schaefer. She was an 80s TV star. 
and she lived in Hollywood, California. Unfortunately, a 19-year-old man named Robert John Bardot was an obsessive fan of hers and wanted to know where she lived. He claimed, when he asked his local private investigator, that he just wanted to write a, a letter to her and get a signature. He was a big fan. But unfortunately, the, the private investigator didn't do his due diligence, allowed that person, John Bardot, to have her address, and then John Bardot drove all the way to Hollywood and then murdered her right outside of her apartment. So he had contacted his local private investigators based in Tucson under a ruse, and then he got the information. So tragic, very tragic. But as a result, we have uh, laws in place, and it's unethical for us to provide an address to, inf to people without a permissible purpose, okay? We can't just hand over the, the address for you. You gotta have a criminal or civil case or be engaged in an insurance investigation. We take it a step further as if somebody wants an address, we have to make sure that their background checked on our end. We have to make sure they have no TPOs or protection orders against them or warrants for their arrest and money more. And as a result of that, the Divers Protection, Privacy Protection Act, DPPA, was instituted. And then lastly, entrapment. Entrapment is another big one. Here's a California private investigator named Chris Butler. He was famous in his world for setting up dirty DUIs for his clients. He would hire buxom bombshell blondes, tell them to go into the same bar that his client's husband's or a significant man was, and these women would get this guy drunk, smammer drunk, ply him with alcohol, buy their drinks, and then when this, these guys would leave, he'd have a sting operation set up. He would he had to bribe many police officers and sheriff department deputies to pull these guys over and get them DUIs. A dirty tactic, and obviously that's entrapment. Entrapment is luring someone into committing a crime they would not otherwise have committed. Okay, Chris Butler got in big trouble for that. He served some prison time. Definitely would advise against doing that. But... What does that look like in the field now? Is it entrapment to place a few dollars in quarters near your claimant's vehicle if they have a back injury? That way they bend over at the waist, pick them up, and then you got video evidence of them having bent over and they said it couldn't? Is that unethical? What do you think? Leave a comment below on that. And is it also legal or unethical for me to show up at my claimant's front door, pretend like I'm a satellite dish salesman or a repairman, a roof repairman, then set up a ladder near the door or the roof and have my, my subject climb to the roof to observe the roof issue or where I'd put the satellite dish and then have my buddy down the street who's also a private investigator film it from his surveillance position. Is that unethical or illegal? Yeah, you entrapped him. He wouldn't have come out otherwise. And since you're not actually a roof repairman and a satellite dish repairman, you're misrepresenting yourself. So those are the laws, but how do you comply with hiring a good private investigator or establishing that your PI can do the job? We talked about what you can do to educate, prevent, and report, and you know what to do when it comes to the claims process, but how do you hire a reputable firm? Well, there's a few baseline things, okay? There's a few baseline things. We mentioned licensing. We mentioned that the, the, the private investigators in 45 of the 50 states have to have a license that includes the background check, the fingerprint, the reference checks, the exams, the experience proof, the college degree. The license has to be provided to you. There's a wall license that we would show and a card, typically. And then private investigators should operate and have to operate with an insurance. Many times it's bond, but mainly it's insurance. So in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana, we have to have insurance for that. They go through high levels of um, negotiation to get make sure that we're covered. Our employees are covered, our cyber risk assessments, our general insurance, our errors and omissions, and much more. And then the professionalism. That's a fluffy term. How do you display professionalism? Well, in, in my space, it starts with website, 
a website that hasn't been changed since 95 is a dead giveaway that you may not be working with a pro. It's also not about just suit and tie. Certainly you don't want trench coat and fedora, but it's not just about suit and tie either. Um, it's knowledge of the laws. It's knowledge of ethics. A good private investigator, a friend of mine and colleague out in California said, hey, I said, what's the best marketing tactic for a private investigator? And you just said ethics. If you act ethically, word gets around that you do the right thing, even when asked to do the wrong thing. There's countless times where I've had lawyers tell me to do something unethical or illegal. I have to stop them right in their tracks and say, we're not going to do that. And then niche. Don't hire someone who doesn't understand the niche. If you have a criminal investigator and you're doing a murder investigation, hiring a private investigator who has that skill set is great. But if they're, you're also trying to do an investigation for insurance fraud, they might not have the chops. So hire for a specific niche. And then experience. Not only do they have to display that when they get a license, but hiring a guy right out of high school to handle your workers' comp claim is probably a recipe for disaster. The firm has to have experience. The team has to have experience. Oops. And then lastly, communication. There's a saying in our industry that private investigators don't pick up our phones. That's a big problem. If they don't pick it up and they don't return your call within an hour, you got a problem. If you submit a report and it goes in this mysterious black box and at the other end you just get a report and an invoice, you failed. Again, we have to be honest and transparent about everything we do. We also have to update you because you're part of the team as much as we are. Your lawyers might be as much a part of the team as we are. So consistent updates on work that's been done up to that point, updates after every day of surveillance, updates after every time you go out on in the field, updates on whatever it is that you do with from an investigative standpoint. And at the very end, then you can put that in the detailed section of your report. So communication is crucial. Okay. Questions. Ask me anything. I'm all ears. I love talking about this stuff. What questions do you have? Leave a comment below. Here's some additional resources for you. My website and blog where I frequently post about all things private investigations is gravitasinv.com. Gravitasinv.com. My YouTube channel, which you're watching now, unveils the mystery behind private investigations and answers all your burning questions. We've got about 1,700 subscribers now and over 100 videos on all things PI. And lastly, I'm offering free 15-minute calls to anyone who needs a consultation. I, again, I love to talk about that. So even if you don't have a case now, you're always going to need a private investigator. And if you want to shoot the bull, I'm all ears too. Hey, thanks so much for watching. It's been an absolute pleasure. Have a great day.